Let's start with the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, public audience? Anybody? Diana? <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Great. Um, Cover you next time. Well, now? Yeah. Uh, so at SHS, uh, coming up this week is our second spirit rally of the year. Um, now we haven't had, weren't able to do spirit rallies, uh, since I think four or five years ago, uh, before COVID, uh, with sports, uh, girls basketball is 12, one currently this season. Uh, boys hockey is seven, one and wrestling is 10, zero in dual meets. Uh, over at Terrafil, the modular, modular classrooms that I mentioned last week uh, should be in by this week or early next week. Uh, and at HGMS, over 20 girls will be participating in the SHS annual Girls in Engineering program, mm -hmm. uh, where girls from the middle school come to the high school and try out the robotics lab and the STEM lab and all of that resources and uh, to get more girls inter interested in those careers and those opportunities at the high school. And uh, also at HGMS, there were four winners in the CT Scholastic Art Awards. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no updates. Yes. Nothing. Not yet. No. Yes. Well. Oh. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. Oh, we um, are starting the legislature will convene in February fifth, and we. Um, we had a, 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 cave, uh, a cave meeting, and uh, the legislative breakfast has been changed from February 15th to February 20th. A lot of the breakfasts in the state are going on. Legislators are um, eating with boards and um, with selectmen and um, with finances. But some of the big priorities that we need to really be concerned about this year, um, you know, are, is the science of reading, of course, the waiver you've heard about, the implementation. The SPED funding um, and some of the mandates, the time frame for implementation, construction projects, um, transportation for out of district out of district students, and that happens to be a very very big one, and then the um, forty million dollars um, for grants for magnet schools that was allocated last year from the 150 million. So these are some of the big big areas that we're going to take we really got to pay attention to and and you know we're asking those that are interested in testifying because it's a short session so we're going to be comprising you know a lot of things and compacting it in a short amount of time but these are some of the th some of the things in the areas that um that everybody seems to be very concerned about on a global scale within the state so not just with here but all, we all have about the same same similarities in, in what's going to be happening with budgets right now um board members from around the state the board chairs have talked about their budgets and budgets increase where they are again tough year and uh so anyway this is something that we need to pay attention to on the other note i'll be heading off tomorrow for the my annual nsba board meeting and or part of the board meeting and the equity symposium which will be taking place on saturday and we have about 800 board members and colleagues and education leaders attending in dc so um, this is the equity symposium for all of us, and we'll be discussing strategies and trends and best practice, practices around the country. We will also be on the Hill while we're there for the Advocacy Institute. So this is going to be another year because it's election year this year, 2024. So this year in particular, we've got several um, congressmen and senators that will be coming. Um, Miguel Cardona will also be coming. So we hope to have some great engagement with some of them because we are very concerned of what's going and proceed from here on right until elections. So this year will be a little bit different with everyone there. We have about a thousand attendees from around the country that will be there. So we'll be having some very robust discussions with our Connecticut contingent. We have appointments on Monday and Tuesday with all of them. So we'll be spending some considerable time with them to talk about, um, you know, the key advocacy things that are happening in, in, in D.C. And, and really one of the big things is, as I've mentioned, is the title funding and the SPED funding. And that is basically around the country for just about every district. And what they're asking us is to show data, tell them 
what is going on back home in our local districts. And this is something that we really need to stress with our local Connecticut contingent in DC so that they understand what, what is going on. So it's gonna be a busy, busy several days. Um, I wish I could say it was a lot of fun, but it's just gonna be a lot of work and also a lot of angst because we really do have to stress the importance of what's going on in DC is gonna affect Hartford. What's happening in Hartford is going to affect all of us. So that's where we are. I hope you can uh, attend the legislative breakfast in um, state capitol. It's on February 20th and um, in the morning. So we're trying to get as many board members from um, the correct region in attendance and legislators there also. This session we end in, in May. So, um, so that's where we are. Um, I would like to um, mention that we had an amazing Martin Luther King Day in Simsbury celebration, um, annual um, annual event we have, and we were very fortunate this year to have uh, Dr. Teresa Bachelor as our keynote speaker, which was amazing. And for those of you who missed it or weren't here or couldn't come, um, it will be on Simsbury Community Media, so please check out their website and find it. Um, and it was, NBC came and talked to the student members of our memorial committee, which was great. And we had the uh, Gertrude Banks Gospel Choir, which knocked the roof off the, off the place once again. And um, it was wonderful. Our Congresswoman, John Hayes, came. Um, and we just had a really nice turnout and a really great day. The intonation sang, which is always Greg Babel, and it was a wonderful um, commitment from them as well. But it was a great day. And great. The, the theme was peace and belonging. and. Uh, I was uh, happy to be part of it and be there. And thank you for all the people who participated and all the students. I'm all set for now. I was able to um, participate in some meetings uh, this morning that reminded us, reminded me of one of the things we do really well in this town, which is partner between our school system and our town side of government. And these meetings were actually the emergency preparedness people. Um, uh, Michael Berry and his assistant, Jim Trevacante, and our fire chief, Jim Baldus, asking to engage with us in terms of preliminary planning if we ever had to open a shelter again. So we did some reminiscing about surviving the 2011 <laughs> shelter experience um, and then talking about um, what it takes if that kind of emergency um, comes up and, and where um, the school system needs to partner with the town in terms of our facilities. Um, our three shelter, our, our primary shelter being Simsbury High School, so we spent a long time there. And then um, Squadron Line and Terrafil actually also serve as sort of backup centers, more like warming centers, come charge your phone, come. Um, and we went to all three buildings, myself and our new supervisor of maintenance, <coughs> Kyle Loveland, participated with the folks from the town and then the principal and the head custodian from each building and great partnership and you know you kind of walk away feeling good about um you know doing some good work for the town so everybody felt comfortable like if we need the shelter they they do a great job planning ahead i can tell you that <laughs> sure. Sure. nothing now uh, I was just going to put in a plug for uh, the guys and balls uh, next week. So just uh, hope, encourage everybody to, to go out and uh, see the high school students in that show. It's a great show. So hope everybody gets to, uh, gets to go. Perfect. Mr. Craig. Two quickies. Mm -hmm. um, in your folder, um, when we had sent out the board packet, we said that we would uh, also send a document providing a little more rationale about the staffing. Um, so you have that to refer to as Neil goes through his presentation tonight and might help you with some of the questions or help to frame some questions. And then I, we, everybody gets a copy of the initial building blocks of the budget binder, right? And we build this as we go through. Um, so it has, um, for example, Katie's presentation from last board meeting in it. And we'll have a copy of Neil's presentation in it. Uh, it has the budget timeline in it. So familiarize yourself with it as you uh, go home tonight and want to do some wonderful reading. But it does have, I was telling Jess before, uh, in the last tab, historical data which is really, really great. It goes back, um, we start this sheet in early 2000s, we can go back further, but it gives you historical enrollment trends, historical staffing trends, uh, incident rates in special education, what the cost of living increases have been, what the town budget increases have been. It's just a whole host of data that can help familiarize different factors and where we're at. 
um, as things come up. So we find it very helpful as we go through, um, particularly um, board event meetings, board of finance meetings, when people have have questions about how enrollment related over time to staffing and different things. Um, all really good to be able to to grab from from here. All right. That's all I got. All right. Okay. So caught up in the mic. Uh -huh. Uh, next on the agenda is the approval of the January 9th meeting. Uh, minutes, sorry. Make a motion. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Abstain. Abstain. Two abstentions. Uh, information and reports, the budget. Yeah, so so we'll we'll get right into it. Neil's going to be the main driver of this presentation tonight. So it's kind of part two. We had heard from uh, Katie about special services overview, um, and certainly there were significant staffing pieces um, that we talked through. So many of those will be back tonight uh, as Neil presents, and we'll have an opportunity to um, ask questions about them as well. But what we try to do in this presentation is give a little bit of the historic enrollment, staffing information, what some comparatives look like and trends look like over time. And then we get into, at this point, what we're saying is still in, in play or still in process as, in part of, uh, as part of the staffing request that we may move forward and discuss even further at the workshop. All right. Let's just All right. Ahead. Let's jump right into it. Uh, as uh, our uh, veteran board members know, this process for us at the central office um, really begins in November as principals start to plan their building budgets and submit them to us. And then there's an opportunity for each um, building principal and a few other key um, department heads to come meet um, with us. At that point, um, we're really trying to hear their needs. So Matt and Sue and I try to do more listening than talking at those meetings. Let them be able to... Um, present what they see as their needs, even though we already knew it's going to be a tough budget, but we need to we need to be able to listen to what um, folks are seeing as their needs in the building. You're going to see my, as Matt said, um, much of this uh, new, anything new in here is what I'm presenting, um, and that's going to be heavily weighted towards special education as um, Katie um in her last presentation two weeks ago, demonstrated some significant growth in certain areas and why that's going to um, call for um, potentially new staffing. So anytime we look at uh, where personnel um, is in the, as a driver of the budget, by the time you um, add uh, salaries and insurance and benefits together, it approaches 80% of the budget. Of so we're a people-driven business. That's where the dollars are, um, and that therefore um, this is this is really uh, an important place for us to ground ourselves as the as the budget process begins. So I'm going to give you a little context uh, with that enrollment piece and kind of where we've been over the last four to five years, and um, have broken it down first with a uh, enrollment slide that hopefully. Uh, demonstrates for you and the public where we've been. Um, and I took it from the COVID year forward, and you can see that um, in just that amount of time, we've gone up 159 <coughs> elementary students, which is uh, pretty significant in a short period of time. You know, the picture of stability at the middle school, literally one student difference from where we were <coughs> four years ago to now, and then um, equally stable uh, at the high school, although this year the, the high school is actually going to dip down in this coming year. But you can see we've been in this period of, uh, at the secondary level, very stable staffing. Um, Want to be able to, um, in a second, show you we've, we've done pretty well managing that staffing at the elementary level with the efficiency of those 159 additional students if you said hey 20 students per class or thereabouts that's about eight teachers we haven't needed to hire anywhere near that 
because there was flexibility in the existing classrooms to absorb students. So, uh, and I can show demonstrate that for you in a second. Wanted to be able to show you overall where we are with staffing, and certainly we are up in those four years on the certified side. And you can see from an FTE standpoint on the far left there, it adds up to 13.62 new positions. Um, and, and the note on the bottom is where uh, I'm trying to uh, attribute that enroll. It's enrollment trends at the elementary level. It has required some additional teachers. You will recall we added several mental health support social workers in the last few budgets and some other positions um, related to uh, supporting special ed leadership. Mm -hmm. And um, in addition, um, uh, uh, handling or dealing with some very large elementary special ed caseloads last year where we added a number of teachers. So that's sort of where the, the additional positions come. We, we have been able to hold the line on non-certified positions as challenging as that has been over the, over the four year time period. You can see that, um, and that doesn't usually come during budget season. That happens during the summer when we start to get retirements and resignations and say, how can we start to move some people and, and maybe not fill <coughs> positions? So um, always, always hard to um, forecast, but I think we really do a good job making sure that we're trying to manage budgets as we go along. Um, and then actually through some restructuring that we've talked about, um, actually lowered administrative positions. That's not to say you know, that, that there weren't other positions put back in, but strictly in terms of administrative union positions, we're down to um, in the last four years. So yep. an in increase of staffing of um, 12 people overall in four years. Yeah, sorry to interrupt you, sorry. just for a clarification, non-certified, is that paraprofessionals? What falls into that bucket? Everything that is not a teacher or administrator who's a so certified so a paraprofessional, a custodian, a secretary, every work in the cafeteria, everyone, uh, librarian. Cafeteria is a little different okay. because that's a separate fund, so we don't count that FTE. Okay. So the, the two that don't really fall toward the FTE count would be cafeteria workers and because of our contract with Salters bus drivers. They sort of work for us, but they really work for Salters. So that's um, so those those are the positions that I would say are not part of the FTE count. Almost everyone else you can think of is non-certified. Got it. Thank like you. Like a computer technician would mm -hmm. fall there, mm -hmm. all sorts of other folks. Just now, when we're looking at numbers, just like the decimals, how do we get, I get make full-time, part-time, just trying to, how do we get to these decimals that are um, 0.23. You should sit with Cindy Freeling for a little while <laughs> and do um, FTE counts. Literally, a, a, a the teachers it runs out pretty well, but yeah. I I can have a I'll, I'll do a teacher example for you. We'll have a teacher that um, like a specials teacher at the elementary school who's a music teacher, and they do four days out of every six to teach the classes mm -hmm. that come through, they're a 0. 0.67 teacher. Yep. So, um, and that, and then when you get into the paraprofessionals mm -hmm. and they work 25 hours and what a percent, what a decimal that is versus 29 hours versus 32 hours. And there's all sorts of decimals. And Cindy thinks she's not good at math, but she really <laughs> is. <laughs> she's fabulous. I can tell you. Um, so we're going to take, we're going to start, we're going to break it down as I typically do for this presentation of elementary, middle, and high school. So starting with the elementary and um, uh, wanted to uh, bring you back to those days where we were sitting here in masks and planning for the 2021 school year and how were we going to get class sizes down to mm -hmm. between 15 and 18 so that we could properly separate kids and give them social distance and made a pretty big sacrifice in our district to move a whole lot of people who were our key personnel doing our instructional coaches and our language arts consultants and our SRIP teachers and pushed them into classroom positions. So we had this temporary bubble 
where we actually, in that school year, had 123 elementary classroom positions. If I pulled up the year before that, it would have been a little less than that 107 that you see in the in the next year. So we pushed positions in, and then as we came out of COVID and put them back to the support positions that um, we that we have uh, come to value in our district. The number, just from an enrollment standpoint, when we came out, we needed 107 teachers, and we had no maybe one class above class size guidelines really um sort of hit the mark in terms of uh class size guidelines at the elementary level over the last three years so two years ago we did need to add three teachers uh some of you will remember all in the summer we had to add all three of those fairly late in the game um and now we're going to project another year of of flat so um, that's not to say there isn't some movement. What I'm calling for in the projections is that they're actually for next year would be one more teacher than exists this year at Latimer Lane and one less teacher at Tooton. But that overall from a district standpoint, it would be that 110 that we settled at. So that's not, so if you go back to the first slide where um, I talked about a um, hundred, it, it, it's, how many new students, if you take that 21-22 school year, um, 2,084 elementary students and projecting for ne next year, 2190, in three years, that's 106 more students, and yet it's only three teachers. So there's an efficiency there that we're capturing um, by, you know, we... Um, as I've said before, we look at it every week during the summer, we monitor it, we do it week to week and get it right so that we're getting just as many teachers as we need and not too many teachers. So um, uh, I think we do a very good job at this level getting the staffing right. Um, just a quick question on sure. that. So how are you able to only increase three teachers with 150 something new students is it just the classroom sizes have increased across the board so um if you if you have um a classroom at the primary level that has eight like, like let's take a uh, many of our schools central Tooton and latimer tend to have three sections of each grade let's say they have 18 in each grade in each class of first grade 18, 18, 18. More kids can move in. Let's say six kids in a grade move in, and now the classes are 20, 20, and 20. That didn't require me to hire a new teacher. So it's absorbing kids all throughout the elementary staffing or classroom grid, I call it. And, you know, we literally monitor it every single Friday from March to August. Mm -hmm. And we have those guidelines. and current state of the state is we don't have any sections over the guideline. Mm -hmm. so What's the guideline again? 24? Yeah. Uh, Go kindergarten through second grade, um, 18 to 22, so sort of a cap of 22. And then third through sixth grade, 21 to 25, so sort of no more than 25. Got it. Thank you. Yep. Um, where are we focused this year for elementary staffing in terms of new positions? Um, and this is this is a copy and paste from two weeks ago at the first uh, chunk with uh, uh, focused on special ed supports, um, elementary intensive learning needs. Katie showed you the tremendous growth of uh, uh, just this year alone, 11 new students into um, that program. Um, and, you know, looking at leadership of that program we um, recognize some challenges this year um, with space with communication um, there have been a number of um, meetings that Katie and, and um, Matt and Sue have had with some stakeholders from that program trying to you know really answer some challenges that have arisen and then we're at an all-time we will be at an all-time high for special education preschool need next year so um, really focusing there. Um, reading support specifically at Central School, this is a request that came in. 
it's an interesting one that I think we have to really take a hard look at administratively. Um, it's some new sort of needs that we're seeing beyond like a typical tier two, what we would call a SRIP intervention of, of a, a, a kid who's struggling in reading, needs a little boost of some extra reading and sort of goes back to a tier one instruction and not like a full blown, like referred kid to special education. It's somewhere in between there. And so a couple of principals actually put in some requests around this and we think it's an interesting discussion, but we also think we need to look hard at resources we currently have. Like what could the, the SRIP teachers pick up some of these students that are emerging or could the special ed teachers pick up some of the, these um, students that are emerging? So this was a this was a robust discussion with some of our principals about these new um, reading needs, and one that um, certainly Betsy Gonzalez, our elementary uh, curriculum uh, director, is digging into, as well as Katie Crisula, Sue, all part of those conversations. Yeah, sorry, I have another question. Sure. Yeah. Do the, the principals and the people you spoke with, do they have a sense of what is driving this? Is this a COVID result of COVID and reading intervention needed as a result or there's, something else? I, I think that's a piece of it. And I also think there's um, been a focus on um, meeting the needs of students with dyslexia. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to let Sue comment further because she's way smarter about this than I am. That's on video, too. <laughs> <laughs> We've actually been focusing a lot of the special education professional development on dyslexia and looking at some of those flags and markers. And what we know about dyslexia is when we intervene early, we can remediate a lot of the issues that we might see, right? So it's not a full blown, it doesn't come to a level of necessarily needing specialized instruction, but if we intervene early and with specificity, we can remediate. So it's a little bit of that. It's some COVID components. Um, there's also a hoped for shift with some of the science of reading and how that instruction earlier differently focusing on different things will help to change that tide so it's dependent but we think that those are some of the major drivers behind this request so just so i understand on the dyslexia point is it you, you think that our teachers are now better trained to spot early and so that's why there's more intervention required i believe that there is a correlation of some of the very specific professional <laughs> development that we've done around these red flags in the classroom and the need for intervention because we're knowing better and we're doing better but it might lead to some additional supports and different ways to provide them did that professional development roll up through so that other teachers beyond just the K-6 are now understanding and learning these red flags? On both the gen ed side and the special ed side, yes. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> and then the last one on here is just a, was a very small request that this is kind of a bounce back. We, we are seeing some, uh, our instrumental lessons dipped during COVID, they are coming back. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a current part-time position that would be a very small request to move to full time. So when you look at that in terms of FTE, um, this was the top three being the requests that you saw from Katie last week, um, which are two FTE related to special education teachers in the intensive learning needs program, the uh, coordinator position, and then the preschool position. Um, we have the request that we are putting forward is for a 0.5 reading teacher. And then the strings teacher is a point two. So the current employee is a point eight employee. This would just be rounding out that person to full time. It's a pretty small commitment of resources um, and sort of makes sense for where the program's at right now. Um, we'll see if we can do it. We'd like to support that. Um, and then, so each of these takes sort of the staffing and then ties dollars to that. So if you, if you take a, what we do is take the salary of a mid-level um, teacher on the salary scale. We say we're not gonna we're not gonna 
project that every teacher we hire is a brand new teacher, but we also know most teachers leaving who are retiring are high salary teachers. Mm -hmm. So we project for a middle of the salary and then add a benefits package in. And that's how you get, if you had to look to the second, I'm sorry, the third one down would be the best example. The 101,000 would be a mid range teacher with a full benefits package is what they would earn. So that's not all salary. I just want to be clear about that. Um, but you, you can see that that placeholder of about $100,000 for budgeting purposes is what an FTE, as we plan, costs. So here at the elementary level, you can see 4.7 FTE with these requests. Okay. Going to transition to the middle school if there aren't any other questions. We have a strings person right now, right? No, we do. Mm -hmm. This has been a 0.8 position for a while. Mm -hmm. We had a longtime teacher who actually vacated this position mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. who um, had requested to be 0.8 for other professional reasons. Really good ones. She played in the Hartford Symphony Orchestra. <laughs> um, um, but, you know, it didn't, it, it, there's, no reason why other than her request that it was a point eight position so the um right now for strings at the elementary um there's uh, a teacher who goes between tooten hills and latimer mm -hmm. there's a teacher who goes between squadron and terrafil and then the central school teacher is one teacher who does both strings and band lessons, like does those two things together. So we got all sorts of combos there. Um, so I would say when you add that up, it's um, right now 1.8 plus 0.5, 2.3 strings teachers at the elementary <coughs> level. That's how you get decimals, Josh. <laughs> In my head, yeah, thank you. <laughs> So, all right, let's transition to the middle school if people are up to that. You can see, again, stability has been our core here, um, as I showed in the first slide. Um, but we are going up to, um, for the first time in a while, more toward that closer to 700 number that uh, the incoming 6th to 7th grade class is larger than the very small 8th going to ninth grade class so that you can see um, this is going to require some additional FTE. End of the day, I'm adding one FTE to Henry James based on a request, but you're going to see in a second here I've done a trick here where what we're going to do is trade some FTE between Simsbury High School and the middle school so that if more kids are coming into the middle school, and less kids are going to go to the high school, we probably are going to shift some teachers, at least a few sections of what they teach, toward the middle school. And we've done that historically. Um, at times, it um, is really easy to do. At times, it's more challenging. But it's always sort of doable um, as you um, try to make your resources as efficient as possible. So. This is what the teams are projecting for next year. So you can see, I'll fo follow it from left to right. Uh, seventh grade, we're saying three full teams because they have 335 students. So you take 335 students, divide it by three. There would be 111.7 students on a team. And then that group of kids on any given period sort of goes five different ways mm -hmm. between their subjects. So you divide by five and then you get what the average class size would be and you're saying 22.3 for that grade. For the last four years with that really stable set, what we've been doing is one grade was 3.0 teams and another was 2.6. So now this is both because the number is so Comparative, the next grade is 343. You do the same division and you can see 22.9. So those are still 
that'll be challenging mm-hmm. to schedule. Those are, you know, push the to to make every class in that below twenty five. Jacqueline Petrello will have her work cut out for her, mm-hmm. but she's good, man, and I know she'll mm-hmm. get it done because she she has in the past um, working with similarly challenging numbers. So, um, and we, we're you know well we're within our class size guidelines, but that's going to require additional, F, you know, uh, two more sections. So point four FTE more of English, science, social studies, math, health, health PE, etc. So here's how I'm recording it. Um, the other requests before I get into the FTE at the core subjects, um, once again, we saw our middle school principal come forward with a reading request of hearing that there was a um, significant group of sixth graders coming up with specialized reading needs. So he also put in a request for additional reading support given um some of the needs that were being reported to him uh, in that area. So same thing I will say to you about the elementary. We're looking at existing resources to say, you know, are these kids that um, we can pick up with the reading position we already have at Henry James? Um, is there some of, uh, some of this that would go to special education caseloads? which are fairly manageable at the middle school right now. But this, it, again, when I was trying to say, we try to listen to our principals, trying to report to you, this was something our principals were reporting to us as a need. Um, but given a tight budget, we're gonna have to really look at that one. It's a bit of a unique opportunity at the middle school because we have a reading teacher who is retiring. So maybe an opportunity to look at that position with a specific skill set That's right. differently. So for reading specialists or reading assistants, let's just say, at both the elementary as well as the middle school level, uh, you know, we've had these kind of conversations in the past regarding math. <clears throat> if you're adding all these specialists, is that saying something about our underlying pedagogy about reading? Do we need to take a harder look at that? Is there something we're missing in, in that area? And that may not be a conversation for today, but that's kind of we have a lot of questions to look at what exactly are the specialized reading needs that these students have. Are we seeing themes? Are they by class? Are they curricular issues? Are they something else? And then how do we use our existing resources, both in special ed and general ed, to really zero in on and provide focused intervention? So again, the initial request has then translated into a host of questions that we're addressing with Betsy Gonzalez, Katie Crisula, myself, and principals. So certainly more to come. And the student population we're talking about in this case are special education students. By and large, so yes. So, oh, so this is, is, I don't know no, if that's coming, coming through. So that's a good point because <clears throat> I remember last week I asked about the interventionist mm-hmm. intervention yep. that we <laughs> have put in place. Mm-hmm. And I knew we had put those in place for math and reading. Mm-hmm. And so is some of the surfacing through them as well? Some of it is, but this is more of how um, the needs are being kind of unearthed in the sixth grade right now. So you have uh, students in the current seventh grade who will need continued intervention into eighth, plus this incoming sixth creating a little bit of a bubble and we have to say, okay, between the existing staff, how do we really address these more appropriately than we are? And I'll just add to that, I'll get the number close, correct me if I'm wrong. So years and years ago, this goes back to where we created a really robust intervention program at the elementary Mm -hmm. level. We called it SRIP, so it's the Simsbury Reading Intervention Program. Seven certified reading teachers who are highly qualified and skilled reading teachers that can meet these needs. Mm -hmm. So when Neil says we're looking at this in all kinds of ways, it, some of this becomes a prioritization of who are the students with the most significant needs, who are the staff that can meet those needs, and if you shift that model a little bit, what other needs are left either unattended or need to look, be looked at differently. Yeah, right. exactly. So just so I understand, at the elementary level, we were talking about kids in that not who needed not tier two, but maybe something in between tier two and special ed. 
but at the middle school level, we're talking about special, already identified special ed students who need additional reading support. More tier and, three and, and would, special ed. I would ed. say too, and, and this isn't to disagree with Neil, at the elementary level, several of those students are special education students as well. Okay, so is Scott seeing similar, are you attributing it at this, at this point, and I know it's early, to the same kind of um, causes as, as at the elementary school, you know, better identification of dyslexia, some COVID, things like that. Is that the same? I think it's a compilation of all of that. And again, now we've created this student group of students that just aren't responding to our curriculum and on our interventions. So we really have to take a fresh look at it with people who are specialized in providing that instruction. So I think it's a big mix of a lot of different kinds of needs. And I don't want to point to a causal relationship. I know that those things are all correlated together and we just have to look at differently because they're not responding to how we currently have it set up and structured. And with the reading and certifications <clears throat> and skill set, a generalized special education teacher at an elementary level may not have the skill set or the certification that this these, some of these individualized reading programs require. So that's what we're kind of seeing. So it's kind of an evaluation of, of the who reading. is the most qualified person of the lot to meet the needs of the kids. And we and have what kind of analysis and assessment can we do and shift of our resources to meet those needs. And you said we have seven specialized reading seven, teachers? Right? Is it seven? Sort yeah, of be, uh, yes, that's yeah. either six. So across the five elementary schools. Yeah. I can get that real quick. So are people with the reading specialization certifications, are they qualified to handle children who have special education needs and their reading concerns? Or is it a different, or is it another kind of teacher you need, someone who has special education credentials and reading credentials to handle that? Could be a little it bit depends. of both. <laughs> okay. It depends. Okay. It, it depends because we have some students that um, are currently have IEP needs and I would say are best addressed instructionally by non-special ed teachers. And I think we have to look at the, our models in a more fluid way and just say at the end of the day, what does the kid need and which teacher has the best skill set and credentials to meet those needs. So just in terms of the overall summary year, so what I ended up doing with the talking about the shift of FTE from Simsbury High School to um, the middle school is I just took the core subjects of English, um, math, science, social studies, and PE health is sort of the fifth one on team. World language also plays a part in this. So basically said 0.4 in each of five areas adds up to two teachers. So at the end of the day, we're going to look to shift two teachers overall from Simsbury High School to Henry James. So when you see this slide, it's three teachers that would be added to Henry James. But in terms of budget, because there's an offset from Simsbury High School, it's really only a budget impact of one of those three teachers. So that's why that slide looks the way it does. And then conversely with Simsbury High School, you can see here this uh, at the bottom of the slide there going from 1,293 students this year to 1,260. That's that small eighth grade class coming to ninth grade. So there actually is going to be a need for a little bit less teaching staff there. Overall, you're going to see an increase of one because um, uh, we have that request from Katie two weeks ago for another special education caseload manager. So um, a teacher um, who would have a caseload of somewhere around high teens to 20 students on a, who have IEPs um, added on to the current staff we already have. So that would, and she showed you the slide you'll remember of like what caseloads were in other Farmington Valley mm -hmm. district towns and that we were an outlier from there. So she's trying to get those caseloads back to a more manageable level. So it would be an additional teacher there. Um, a point two 
Uh, two years ago, the next year will be year three of our American Sign Language program, and it's popular, and kids keep asking to take it. And um, we right now have that teacher teaching four classes and anticipate that we will certainly need her for five mm -hmm. um, because uh, kids <coughs> want to take it. So um, whether that gets offset by a different world language that maybe has fewer kids, we, we can't really anticipate that until the kids sign up for their courses and we get that information. They sign up for them in another week or two at the mm -hmm. end of January, and then we get the final information right around President's Day to start to look at where we might be able to shift FTE. So how does that shift happen? It's a meeting where um, I referee the Simsbury High School team of Maggie Seidel and Ken Para against the Henry James team of Scott Baker and Jacqueline Petrella. And we set a goal and we hash it up and we figure out which teachers need to move based on what the kids have signed up for. Like, so it's very student driven about what did the kids sign up for and where might we have a retirement that we can capture? Mm -hmm. What department might we be able to go down a teacher? Where can we slide some FTE? Sometimes there's some creative stuff where a certain teacher has more than one certification. So I could have this teacher pick up a math class, even though they're a science teacher. And that's a way that we kind of make the make the stew work between the two. Uh, everybody plays nice, but it, it does take some work to kind of make it happen from a budgetary standpoint. So again, that's the offset. And you can see this slide is showing the marker of what a, a placeholder for 1.2 FTE would be. Can I take you to the previous slide sure. for a second? Sure. Just, uh, if this group has gone over this question before, but just for anybody that may be watching, can you just give the 30 second on um, you've essentially, because I think this question will arise, you've gone down uh, 50 essentially, but your staff has stayed the same. Can you s s talk for a second about how the, the needs have shifted and that's why that, that, that number may have been essentially the same? Yeah, so right now um, there, are, there are little shifts between departments on that. Um, so right now we class sizes are very good at Simsbury High School. So that's why I'm pretty confident that we can come into this um, coming year. But there were, in the last few years, there were no sort of needs to make cuts at that point. Um, and we didn't have a retirement. So we don't go looking to make a cut to make a cut. You know, like the, the, we're very strategic about like once we hire, uh, you know, there's a bottom person of the totem pole who is a new hire, one that we just invested in recruiting and we want to retain, and we don't want to put that person on a cut list. And that's who ends up on cut lists. And we try to avoid that. To the, to the and to your point, at the high school level, the challenge is that with a minor enrollment like that, what you're doing is taking that new hire and saying, we're going to cut point two of your job. Right. Gonna lose that person, right? And you're gaining twenty five thousand, right? Where at an elementary school, if you go down a section, you're absorbing the whole section, right? So some of this, as we work through and we really think collectively about where we can find efficiencies or things we want to do, you have to think about the amount of disruption, how many people you touch with it, and what the dollar figure is you're gaining from it too. Right. You know, it's 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 all a balance. Right. Can we stay on the slide for one second? Um, you said something earlier about the, the one full-time person you're adding to the high school would be to level out caseloads at the high school? Special education. Special. Can you help, please help me understand what that means for a caseload? Is that the, the, the person is responsible for making sure everyone goes where they're supposed to go or they're teaching those 20 students? They're, they're teaching. They're responsible for the IEP management of those mm -hmm. 20 students and in some way, they teach those students, sometimes in a uh, uh, what they used to call resource room, but an ed educational support. And sometimes it's through a co-teaching model that they participate in. So, um, but 
a typical special education teacher, um, right now they have about 25 students on a caseload and more. We're or more. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to like make that far more manageable. Um, so yes, they're both managing the IEP and teaching them. Okay. Did I get that right? It was great. <laughs> so, um, so that's that's really mostly our um, certified side. I did want to highlight a couple of things that our principals brought forward. These are sort of non-certified, much smaller dollar um, amount requests, but um, we actually some um, support positions, paraprofessional support positions. We've had a really great rebound of our culinary program under the uh, talented teacher, Jana Gerga, mm -hmm. um, and she is doing some great work, but that is work that we now, um, in a very busy um, area that includes sharing the kitchen with our cafeteria staff and working in a dining room with the, there, there's a need for some more hands on deck with working with the students in a growing program. So Maggie Seidel certainly put in a couple of requests not only for our culinary program, but um, they're also trying to um, really reinvent since COVID a, a writing center model that involves some peer tutors mostly, but it, it needs some adult support. So these were small requests from Maggie Seidel, but ones where a little bit of dollars might go a long way mm -hmm. um, in terms of supporting some programs that are um, I couldn't resist. I, I left this on from last year. Our substitute shortage is real. We got to talk about it. And, and um, uh, I will tell you that what a building substitute is, is somebody willing to work basically every day so that we pay them more. So we pay a typical substitute about $115 a day. We pay... Um, a building substitute more like $170 a day. But they are committing to working. Uh, we give them a few sick days, but otherwise they're saying, I'm, I'm signing up for 180 days to come in and work for you. Um, and because of that commitment to doing it, they're worth every dollar to pay them more. Um, because cause many substitutes love to do it but they want to do it on their own terms right i could, yeah. i want to work three days a week i don't want to work fridays i don't get up when it's i don't get up when it's snowing outside like this is how i'm gonna work um and that's great and we love them too but our building substitutes um we had we had moved away from that um system when the substitute pool was excellent substitute pool isn't excellent anymore so paying um so to the extent that we can continue right now we have one to two of these people in every building and we'd like to see you know at least two in every building like it would it would be and we can move them around too if there's not a need for two at central school on any one day we can move them um and yeah. then you know we, we always look at our daily rates would you say, <clears throat> I get all of that. Would you say there's also like soft costs there that the kids know this person, see this oh, person, they're immersed in point. the culture. So this person comes in and subs. It probably doesn't feel like a sub. It's just, oh, hey, we have Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so. So there's more than just the dollars that I would think. Great point. Absolutely. And a uh, um, really good point. And that's one of the things that our principals talk most about. And the value of these people when the teacher is out for a week. And you can say, boy, I'm going to put this person in as opposed, you know, and it would look fine if somebody's going to be out for a day. But when somebody's out for a week, it's going to start to impact. And these people are much more capable of coming in for a week to that fourth grade classroom or even that chemistry classroom. And right. Do the building substitutes have to have any certification or specific background? Um, they, they don't have to, but certainly the people that... Uh, what happens is that Cindy Baral, our substitute coordinator, Cindy Freelinger, and I tap these people after they, like you probably start out as a regular sub, we get good feedback, and then we start to say, how'd you like to be a building sub? 
And, you know, that so they tend to be people who have some educational background, but they're not required to be. If I could just add something, I know when I first moved here, I lived down in the East Lime area and I was a substitute teacher. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. I became like a building substitute teacher for middle school. Um, for the in the event that 100 percent of the people show up for work, that, that building substitute, they find other stuff for them to do. Or? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Lunch duties or supervised recess, whatever. Yeah, okay, gotcha. Yeah. And how often I'll, do you I'll, not need a sub? I'll call you when that day comes, yeah. Brian. Yeah, okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, Tara. I'm just said, how often do you not need a sub in a class in a school? Right, never. <laughs> so, wow. so, um, I have been um, certainly uh, as. Connecticut raised its minimum wage over the last few years very rapidly from 10 to 11 to 12 to 13 to 14 to 15 dollars. We were really catching up on some positions. Um, now, my commitment to those positions, we've got to stay above, slightly above minimum wage. You can't ask people to do some of these jobs for what is essentially what they, um, you know, can make out in uh, a, a low wage workplace. So we're staying ahead of the curve with um, some of our general ed para positions, again, cafeteria workers, even our, um, this is a challenge, not on our operating budget, but um, Nikki Mahan running our after school care program needs to stay ahead of the minimum wage to be able to keep people so that's something we're, we're always talking about and keeping an eye on. Um, and Connecticut law, they got to 15, and we thought that was going to be it. But now there is a cost of living adjustment beyond 15 every year that is going to require us to keep going. Um, so, and then, as I said earlier, we also, um, I think, do a very good job examining non-certified um, resignations and retirements when they happen. We ask ourselves every time, do we need to fill this position? Is there a way that we can rethink this? Um, because we know some of these commitments, if we are able to add new positions, you know, this is where we talk about offsets. Where are you going to find an offset? So um, that's something that is an additional consideration as the budget goes in. So the overall themes, as I bring it to the big finish here, the new requests uh, would represent 6.9 FTE. It was 4.7 at the elementary and 2.2 at the secondary level. Um, as uh, you can see, special education services are the clear priority of that 6.9. Um, I'm uh, pleased and I want to be able to stress with this with the other boards as it moves forward. We've been very efficient in our use at the secondary level, that kind of thing of being able to swap between the middle school and the high school. We should highlight that. That is something we're doing to make sure we are um, not requesting additional FTE when we don't need it. Um, the Supporting those smaller requests I just talked about and keeping an eye on labor market trends. Um, you know, our labor market trends, and I know I've also talked a few times about this is where um, uh, J.R. Salter in the bus company are looking at his labor market trends. What are they paying bus drivers in Farmington and Avon and West Hartford? And is he competitive? And making sure that we're, we're um, keeping an eye on all of those things. So when you look at sort of the roll up, this is a uh, slide that our returning board members would be familiar with in terms of format. Um, these are the uh, budget drivers for a personnel standpoint. So the top portion is all sort of the impact of negotiated contracts. You, these are contracts that, um, you know, based on a normal general wage increase, when you add up all the employees within each of those, so you'll see the teachers would obviously be the most um, that uh, Amy Merriweather also has in here, education steps. Um, she actually did a pretty good analysis. We were under budgeting the number of teachers that were obtaining an additional degree and therefore getting more dollars. 
and she um, sort of gave it to me a little bit, going like, "I don't think you're paying enough attention to this, Neil. Like this, th these are real dollars, and we got to start budgeting for it." Um, so she has done a pretty deep analysis of like what percentage of teachers get those degrees every year and what do we have to budget for? So this that's actually sort of a new feature that um, has gone into this. The feathering of staff, those of you who have been here for the last couple of years, this is the this is the ARPA money that she built in over three years, you'll remember, it has to do with some of the non-lapsing money. Um, and then the other uh, negotiated contracts uh, ranging from the group's down to um, unaffiliated where we have some, we have had some posi position removals. So um, that's sort of the fixed cost, if you will. And then the 6.9 FTE are about two thirds of the way down the, sl the slide there. So the 6.9 is right around $700,000 for um, what you can see is a grand total um, of pushing personnel uh, forward would be 3.1 million or 3.78% over your current budget. Um, and this is not, sometimes I have factored insurance into this depending on the year. Amy asked me not to do that. She's gonna be talking about insurance at your workshop on the weekend in a couple of weeks. So this does not include insurance. When we presented to the Board of Finance, the insurance estimate was about a 0.3% increase. Um, but there's some favorability in our internal service fund, and that's what Amy wants to talk about, using potentially some of those dollars um, as an offset moving forward. 0.3 is excellent. <laughs> no, that, the insurance, well, you'll remember what happened last year, right? When it was... What was it, 12%? Yeah, I mean, it was an enormous driver in our budget. Yeah, We've been fortunate started. with the claims and the projections this year. So to start off in a yeah, position great. that's not really heavy-handed and maybe even have some more flexibility will be helpful with the overall piece of the puzzle. Neil, just so I understand what I'm looking at, if we didn't add any new full-time people, so anything below the enrollment-driven staff, Correct. Just paying the people we currently have on staff, what we're obligated to pay them, we're up 2.93%. Right. Is that right? Okay. And Neil, on this sheet, just three quick questions. The NAGE, was that the non-certified? That, th that specifically is custodial and maintenance employees. And then I, number... Sorry to hit you with an acronym. That <laughs> was not... It's all good. Um, and then two more. Um, unaffiliated going down. Yeah. Did I miss that? What? So there are there are five bargaining units um, within our district: teachers, administrators, nurses, paras, and secretaries are one union together, and then custodian and maintenance. If you're not one of those people, you're unaffiliated. So that means many of us who work up here at <laughs> Central Office. Um, uh, Jason, uh, the tech, the, the people who work on our computers, um, security guards, it's like a mishmash of people mm -hmm. that are unaffiliated. They're not with one of those unions. How is that going down? I'm sorry if I missed it. Uh, eliminated positions since last year. There was, okay, there was something eliminated. And then final question, your additional considerations tab, like the building subs and all that. Where does that fall in here, or do we just talk about that, that on the fringes? How does that work? That falls into, um, there's a separate account that is a substitute account that I'm not counting in here. And um, so that that is, um, I'd have to find the budget code for you of what where that lies. But that whole slide, yeah. right? There's so, building sub, the culinary. On that. Yeah. that is not in this number. Yeah. Those are kind of decisions as we move forward, we'll figure out whether we're gonna put them in there or not in terms of, of more discussion, but they're not in this, this it's base. It's like course. a heads up we're thinking. Yep, heads this. up that, hey, our principals have asked about these okay. things, we're taking a harder look um, before we roll them out maybe at the workshop. Thank you. Yep. Just a general question, taking back to one of the first things you said, I think it was in relation to one of Justice's questions about the increased enrollment. You, know, you said that we had the flexibility to enroll, you 
enough to absorb mm -hmm. these these students. But I'm curious if you think are we well maybe if I'm trying to read between the lines a little bit, maybe it feels like it sounds like you think we may be at a tipping point or darn near close to tipping point or I, I don't I wouldn't say darn near close, uh -huh. but if the NASDAQ trend is correct, mm -hmm. yeah, those those extra spaces are gonna fill. Um, you know, and that is the idea of it's always when do I add to have to add the fourth teacher to a grade level or at squadron line the fifth teacher to a grade level mm -hmm. and that's what we're always monitoring. Um, and the rebuilt Latimer Lane is imagining four classes at every grade level, and we have not had that in a long time. We have four at some grade levels now, but not all. And, you know, that those are the tipping points of mm -hmm. where. Um, so I think we're we're good for this coming year. We're easy. We're probably good for one more. And I don't predict beyond that. <laughs> and just to follow up on that, so, and then comfort level on that, you have the, the appropriate amount of space for all of this. Um, we are good you're, you're everywhere. Good spots, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Facilities in the world, my God. It's, it's, what is it's a little preview. Oh, coming on that Saturday. Squadron. <laughs> yeah. Squadron is stressed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Squadron is very stressed right now. Um, you know, Terrafell has never had sort of extra space. It's, it's two per every grade level. Um, thankfully, um, Matthew pointed out that our modulars are opening at Terrafell every day now so that we can get our music programs back out there. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm, you know, we're, we're Latimer's going to help when Latimer opens. But, and, you know, Central and Tootin are okay, but they're not, they're certainly not empty. Neil, what are you hearing from parents and teachers regarding class sizes, right? Um, we've, we have guidelines in place for the various grades. During COVID, we added, whatever, 15 yeah. classes to make them small for social distancing, come out of COVID. Did people like parents and teachers get comfortable with smaller class sizes yes. and want to keep it like that and then push back at all? Like from not just the teachers, but the parents like, oh, I've got 21 kids in my kids fifth grade class. Well, yeah, we can have 25. Right. I we mean, felt that really strongly in that first year back out of COVID. Yeah. People couldn't believe the class size at something like that. And we'd go, wow, historically for the last 20 years, that's what class sizes right. were. Um, and for me, this is always a neighborhood issue. Like, you don't care about class sizes until your kid's class has 25 kids in it. And then that's when I get calls, yeah. many of you get letters and emails, and we start to, um, so, I mean, it, it it's very contextual for people, yeah. you know, when they find out, like, oh, my kid's class is large. And those, I've heard rumors, those guidelines, those specifically elementary classroom guidelines were established like eight years ago. It was a change, right? There was a change a few years ago that were they ever bigger and we brought it smaller or the other way around? Or was we, it always we, been? We did it during COVID, but yeah. we have not changed the guidelines in a while. Three years. Yeah, the yeah. last change was second grade pulling it to that 18 to 22. Mm -hmm. It used to be up to 25 years ago. And I would say a push point for people has become that third grade guideline you get we get a lot of questions on is it really appropriate to have 25 third graders with the challenges we've seen in behaviors or you know I think that's the area you know 25 sixth graders may be a different challenge than 25 third graders that's come up a little bit more. yes are they Simsbury oh, tell guidelines? You recent years Simsbury they're yeah. Simsbury yeah. guidelines not state guidelines sure, right. yeah. Yeah. yeah okay I can tell you when it really comes up is when you have 48 second graders that are 16, 16, and 16. And then you say, well, for third grade, we're going to make that into yeah. two classes. And then 24, 24. 24. Now. Of 24 each. And then I have to uh, stay out of the grocery store at that point. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I really go to the grocery store. <laughs>
I steal it. Great. Um, CIP? Perfect. Yeah. I invited Jason out tonight. We did this once earlier in the year and prior to the workshop where we can dig a little more into that six year and 12 year outlook. Um, I just wanted Jason to do another touch base on what are year one projects because at the end of the day, that's what the board votes on. They vote on the year one of the six year capital. Um, and I, I do believe with the kind of challenge we have ahead of us, there will be conversation with the Board of Finance on prioritizing capital versus operating and are you able to move things out? And that's something that you know board members that have been here um, know will come into play and is a real challenge for us, you know? So Jason, go ahead. All right. So we're bringing forward four capital projects. The first one is the roof placement at Tooten Hills. This is not the entire roof. This is two of the four sections of the roof. Um, specifically, it's the roof over the cafeteria and the roof over the wing that holds both the library and the art classrooms. So that back was built in 2000. Uh, we try to replace roofs in a 20 to 24 year uh, time frame. The roofs in question here, one was from 1995, one was from 2000, so we are pressing that. There aren't specific issues with that roof. We're not seeing an unusual amount of leaks per se, but again, it's more of a staying on top of the maintenance and not letting the, the roofs go too far beyond their warranted expected life. Uh, the next piece is at the high school, the auditorium and amphitheater improvements. So within the amphitheater, we're looking at uh, replacing carpeting and seating, and in the auditorium, replacing the theater lights uh, just as a side note, the amphitheater was used as a makeshift cafeteria during the COVID years. Um, so that carpet has seen more stress than it normally would have. Uh, so but that's that's one of the ones that I'm pushing on to, to make happen. The uh, next piece is uh, district network infrastructure. This is an amount that we ask for every other year to maintain our servers, routers, switches, all the the back of the house uh, network infrastructure. And uh, the last piece is a new every other year that we're, that we're talking about doing. We've, we've seen uh, good success on updating and keeping up to date with the network by using capital dollars every other year. So we looked at things like uh, flooring and also pavement and adding those in as every other year projects. In the past, we've tried to use capital non-recurring, the CNR dollars, for that, but it's fairly difficult to keep these projects uh, moving and, and stay on top of torn <coughs> carpets and worn out tiles. So we're looking to package these into every other year projects instead. So that'll be a new, a new initiative for us, but certainly something that we'd like to do a better job on maintaining. Is the part of the problem? With, I'm sorry, but do nope. it, is the part of the problem with the CNR budget? It's, it's just too limited, especially when you put two budgets or two buses. Yeah, the uh, the the buses is the big problem. Although I would say just generally having that capped for such a long amount of time at the same dollar amount when our maintenance costs have have increased has been difficult as well. And how long has that number been at that level? Thirty years. Thirty years. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So that's that's been a difficult. Uh, it's been difficult to do things like flooring with that sure. when, when the school buses come out of it as well. Yeah. Just a question on the Tooten Hills roof. So there are no issue like major issues with it or leaks or things like this. This is just a every 20, 25 years we replace the roof. Correct. Okay. Can it stretch another year or two? Um, well, it can and, and has been. Like I say, part of this is from nineteen ninety five, so we're already. Out of out of that range, uh, we do, we have, we do. Um, if if we're in a particularly tight place, this is something we can certainly look at ahead of some of the other projects that I would say are more safety related. Because that was going to be my question: is like, what's the, you know, if you had to look at this and say, is there one thing you can do, what would it be? Yeah, if push came to shove. That's that's a large amount to uh, push a year if we had to. I would just. Caution and say when you look down the road in the in the six-year plan, 12-year plan, 
uh, that that million dollars that we're trying to push into the next year is is coming into a crowded location yep. if we do push it. Can this be done in two parts? Could you do, you know, half of the 1.1 now and then half next year? Um, we can look at that. This this particular section um, doesn't lend itself well to that, but it's not something we, we can't investigate. The other thing that will be interesting as we get down the road and we think about capital and we come together with the Board of Finance, it's not a dollar for dollar savings like an operating cut, right? So you can move half of this project out, but it's not going to lower the bottom line like you think it would because of bonding costs and how they have that figured in. So it's an interesting look and conversation that we have in totality. It's called the mill rate worksheet. You start putting all the figures in and we'll be able to see, all right, if you just held all capital for a year, what would the impact be? If you did half capital for the year, what what would the impact be? And that gives you a better feel for, like I said, what's the magnitude of the decisions you're making? You know, is it a high risk decision to move this 1.1 million out when it actually didn't move the debt service line much, right. didn't change the mill rate much, as opposed to you find a way to reallocate four to six FTE on the operating side, bottom line dollars. You know, so it's. You'll see how it comes together in the end when we put it, put it all together, but it's, um, it's a complicated soup. Okay. I just have a general housekeeping because I'm curious question. In my own home, I find carpets to be a pain in the butt to clean. I was going to say the same thing. Are we allowed to, like, are we allowed to just say maybe we'll put pay a little more money and get in, like, non-carpet floors? Yes. Or <clears throat> We've generally been been working under sort of a let's move towards tile yeah. uh, manifesto and pretty much yeah, we did this space. at Latimer right? yeah, especially if you look at Latimer the new construction yeah like there's almost no carpet right. 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 it's definitely a better plan. I, I was going to say the same thing I mean I I think about carpet and I just go Ugh. yeah and when I mentioned the amphitheater carpet I, I probably didn't specify this I'm not putting new carpet back in there it's tile Okay. Oh, it is. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Didn't mean to. Yeah, that was short term because it was tile and then it was carpet. And now, yeah. Yeah. Carpet wasn't a good play. And you hit on it a little bit, Jason, but these four things are what you view as the four most important of a crowded list that's two, three, four, five, six years. We're going to see all those other things on February 3rd, right? That's usually that's how that works. Yeah. So you'll see everything else. It's in our book right now yeah. if you look. Correct. So I, I just, I know this was on the additional considerations, but I just wanted to ask something for clarification. The writing, the writing center support, what's happening now? I mean, we don't have one or we do or is somebody else? It was, it's, it was B, that. go ahead. So um, one teacher in particular, it's, it's, they're relooking at a revamp. So you have some certified teachers in there as duties, but not, um, it's dependent upon teacher schedules and when they're free. You have a level of peer support, and they're looking for some extra non-certified staff to make sure that it can be open all periods um, to meet students' needs. That's what that is. But one teacher in particular has taken on some pretty significant efforts to revamp that intervention. And so when I think, I mean, in the support that they get is it with you know can it be you know 11th and 12th graders with their um prep for college applications and all that it's not just all of that and different kinds of writing and assignments and you know i'm struggling with this piece on elaboration and i just need to go in and get a little peer booster versus some more significant support from a certified teacher okay uh, i am a writing tutor in the center uh yes. yeah like, what are you thinking? <laughs> and uh currently it changes per quarter based on the teacher schedule but it's like periods one five and seven there'll be a teacher an english teacher open to man the station the the room and then um you can have tutors sitting in there for walk-in appointments but it's kind of not really helpful because the student body doesn't really know when the center is open because it's not open the entire day thank you Budget yes, Miss Amy is not feeling well, unfortunately. Uh -oh. Bad um, time to get sick. Yes, tough time, but uh, she'll, she'll be back tomorrow. But the um, a couple things I wanted to share on this, but to let you know, one of the significant things we'll work through at the workshop 
our year-end projections in our major categories. So we'll really take kind of a deep dive into are we forecasting uh, any deficit areas uh, and what are we thinking about there. But in a nutshell, our grant um, revenues this year are pretty stable outside of the excess cost grant for special ed that we talked about at, at length um, at, in the last meeting. So from a, a grant standpoint, we're pretty good in terms of what those budgets look like. Our two biggest challenges are special education transportation in terms of the dollars we're spending on a third party outside of Salters because of capacity. That's, that's what that is. And then the tuition increases with our contracted students in outplacement programs. Uh, we'll recall last year that we asked for an increase of $500,000 in that line item. We received that increase. We had a lot of support from uh, the Board of Finance on that. The tuitions of that same group of students that's pretty stable now went up 10 to 14 percent, which ate up that increase and basically moved that deficit. So those are the two areas we need to really look at and think about as we move forward in our budget and in our projections. Um, Lisa and the Board of Finance, they haven't had the meeting yet, but Lisa is aware of those, of those areas in terms of their overall planning and a potential deficit uh, this year. Um, but there are things we do as the year goes on, obviously, to try to close that and, and maneuver things. But we'll get a deeper look into that um, at, the, at the workshop in terms of just, you know, line items going through and giving you an opportunity to really dig into any questions that you have. Matt, we didn't get that number last week, only two weeks ago, the transportation number. I mean, she didn't have that. Yeah, it wasn't included. That was that I asked. In terms of the... What the cost of what is for those out of district special ed. I think it was 90000 per student on the educational side, but there yeah. was, that did, was not inclusive of transportation. Of transportation. transportation. It wasn't on that yeah. sheet. Um, I don't know the total number. I know we're running in the rears about 400000 on it. Um, but I can get that for you. Okay. Yep. Absolutely. It'll definitely be there second. Oh, yeah. 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 Any other public audience? <laughs> Great. Uh, well, then, our next board, member, board meeting is uh, February 13th. We're right back here in the Board of Ed Conference Room. Get a motion to adjourn. I'll motion to adjourn. Anyone second? Second. <laughs> Are we going to stay no, here? Stay. No, we'll stay here. Okay. Good plan. <laughs> Good plan. Thank you, everybody. Uh,